fasten your seatbelt. It's going to be a bumpy walk. Chrissy is hilarious. Chrissy, have you ever heard of the comedian Basha K. Ali? No, that sounds like something you yell at before you blow up a plane. <laughs> 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 30 seconds remaining. Like, you know, what could you say? I doubt this man. That's the I have no disrespect for you at all. I was very confused by the title, Everything Everywhere All at Once, because that's also what we call it when the ass takes off his shirt. <laughs> 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 I shouldn't be up here. I should be in school. On the other side of the ocean. What's up, boys and girls? Welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, Rumble, uh, like Rockfin, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. We we stream this podcast everywhere that they will let us. Uh, before I bring in a fabulous guest, I have a couple of stand-up shows to tell you about. Um, July 8th, I will be at Jersey. I will be at TIFFs in Morris Plains, New Jersey. Uh, that's July 8th. And I want to let you know the Richmond show, the show in Richmond, Virginia, on August 9th was canceled. They're shutting down the club. So it's it wasn't just me. I am not personally canceled. Thank God for now. Uh, they're shutting down the club. So no show in Richmond for now. I'm going to see if I can find a replacement venue. Uh, and then I'll be in Houston for Anime Matsuri, August 10th through the 13th. Simcast will be there. We'll have a panel. We'll have a booth. We'll be hanging out, cosplaying. Um, signing boobs you know the, the normal things you do at a convention and then i'll be headlining that same weekend at the secret group in houston texas friday august 11th so for tickets go to my website chrissymayer.com please and thank you okay okay so i got a I got a guest here so some of you guys in the chat some of you guys in my twitter mentions have been some of you are upset that i'm bringing her on some of you are excited that I'm, I, I don't know what the big deal is i don't know anyone who uh, has a fiery online presence is somebody i want to talk to she's an investigative journalist and author a former project veritas operative and america first conservative a formal congressional candidate She's spicy. She, we're wearing the same color. We're both redheads. I mean, this is gonna. What more do you need? It's Laura Loomer. Yes, I'm now a redhead. Newly a redhead. How do you feel? Do you do you feel a, like your soul has left your body yet? Well, you know, originally I just had you know jet black hair, and uh, I think I just got a little tired of the Morticia Adams look. Even though I love my jet black hair, so uh, you know, since I'm always. Uh, slaying my enemies online i figured i'd add some red highlights you know it's kind of like blood splatter so i love it i, I love like little, it i love a little redhead moment um so you're it's this is your the red in the light it does no it looks great i saw the pictures uh you were a bridesmaid very recently and i like that you on your trips you're a very good multitasker you're like i'll be a bridesmaid but i will also uh <laughs> go to a james comey book signing and completely <laughs> completely cause a scene in the best way possible i think um but yeah we first want to talk about so you're a bridesmaid did you tell your friends like hey i'm gonna this was obviously after the wedding you're like i'm gonna go and i mean i guess if your well, your friends probably all understand and love you for what for what you do my, at friend, this my friend angela my best friend who got married actually she <laughs> she likes all the activism sometimes she even comes with me so it was actually her idea because uh days before i you know came to her wedding i got a call from one of my other friends who said oh james comey is coming to town you want to fly out and you can go confront him and i said i'd love to but i'm going to a wedding and uh, I was getting ready to leave. And then uh, Angela calls me the morning of that I'm supposed to fly out. And I flew out on June 1st. And she's like, oh, my God. And I thought, oh, God, like, what kind of wedding crisis am I going to have to, like, listen to now? Because she sounded so upset, you know. And she goes, she goes, guess what? And I said, what? She goes, James Comey's going to be in town. And I said, yeah, but we have your wedding. So how are we supposed to go see James Comey and go to the wedding? She said, it's the day after my wedding. 
so we can go. And she purchased the two tickets and. Oh, wow. We, we can. And is that whose voice you can hear on, on the other phone? Yeah. That's my, best. she was fantastic, especially when the cops showed up, she was like, yeah. And what crime did she commit? I was like, Whoo, that's a, that's a good friend to just be there ready with the facts and remember like, why she's my best friend. And we you have to this credit card. We said, Hey, you know, I got to steal your wife. I know you've only been married for less than 24 hours, but we're going to need money for bail. And he said, here's my credit card. So <laughs> wonderful well, husband. This right? was so great. So you go to this venue. Um, this was part of James Comey's book tour. And for those of you who have, I know some of our listeners are more politically enthusiastic than others. Basically, James Comey was the FBI was he the FBI director that that basically I don't know if it, I mean, I feel like Russiagate was it more the Clinton's idea. I don't know. I feel like he's the one who really he pushed it. The FBI director who, uh, you know, briefed President Trump on the salacious and unverifiable steel dossier that was a part of Crossfire Hurricane, the Russia collusion hoax. And of course, we now know that that steel dossier was completely fabricated and made up. Uh, it was based off of, um, you know, lies and uh, they used it to. Uh, perpetuate, you know, this witch hunt against President Trump. And it was funded by Hillary Clinton's campaign, right? So President Trump's political opposition. And we know that uh, the FBI uh, spied on his campaign when he was running against Hillary Clinton. So uh, the entire Russia collusion hoax and the fabrication regarding, you know, the Steele dossier and the entire crossfire hurricane investigation was really orchestrated by James Comey. So, um, and of course, President Trump fired him. And then, he ended up, you know, getting one book tour deal. This was five years ago. So this is actually the second time that I've confronted James Comey at one of his book tours. Wow. Do, mm -hmm. do you think he recognized you? How could he not? How could he not know you at this point? I don't know. But that's why when I stood up, I said, hey, you remember me? You remember me from your book signing? So I had shorter hair back then because I used to work for Project Veritas. And, you know, originally I was a blonde. And <laughs> then I decided to dye my hair black and. I had short black hair, so now I have longer hair because it's been. And fun. is this closer to your natural color? Because I saw you as a blonde. You're like a, you look no, like a completely different person. My hair, my natural hair color is actually blonde. Believe wow. it or not. But I just Same. got kind of tired of it, and you know, working for Verit Veritas, going undercover a lot. I dyed my hair a lot because, you know, I was doing several investigations at the same time all throughout the country, and. Sometimes I just needed to like rapidly have a different appearance. And so I would just change my hair color a lot. Wow. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I too am a natural blonde. I'm like a dirty blonde, but I, I wanted people to know that I'm crazy right away. So, oh, yeah. uh, so I had to go ginger. So here we are. You buy tickets to this, uh, this event. How much were the tickets for this? And is this in some sort of what black box theater? So the tickets were about $40 a piece and it includes the book. So $80, I'd say. Um, I think it was like, it came out to like 78 something, but it was, you know, you round it up. So it was about $80 and um, the location in Naperville, Illinois, where this was taking place was actually at a Christian community church center. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, this Christian church community center was hosting James Comey. And then I know today in Austin, Texas, he's at the Austin public library. So I don't really yeah, think they, a lot of people are too excited to see him. These mm -hmm. venues are really not large. I mean, from the looks of the video tonight, I see my friend Owen, I was on Infowars this afternoon and we were talking about how Owen should go and confront Comey. And he's like, you know what I'm going to. And uh, I guess he just did a few moments ago, right before I got on your show, um, the video I posted on my Twitter. That's so but, exciting. So you got him yeah. just two days ago and Owen got him tonight. And know that these the folks at this uh, venue here are not acting very Christian towards you. And no, it's not super crowded. Um, this is what we, we would call a light crowd. And so you you go up. I mean, I'm <laughs> <laughs> during this because I'm imagining if I had to do this, I think my heart would beating would, would start beating. So, and I do stand up comedy and I'll get up in front of like to tens of people. No, sometimes well, hundreds it kind of, of people. Reminded me, you know, like it kind of reminded me of a stand up comedy skit because just the tee up for this, like, Oh, I've been criticized. And, you know, 
Uh, you know, in order to be a great lawyer, you have to be a great storyteller. I mean, for me, that was just a punchline in itself, right? Like, oh yeah. You're basically Did you think of that like just before? Yeah, like it just hit me. You know, I That's always great. thought to myself, I always thought to myself, if politics fails, you know, I'm I'm Jewish, I'm witty, I'm a woman. I guess I could always be a stand-up comedian, right? So you definitely could. So this is like, and I'm thinking you have to hold your phone. And I'm like, man, should you be wearing a body cam? I just feel like you're going right into the lion's den here. I mean, like it would be maybe a, a retirement home for lions because everybody in this audience uh, is definitely over 65. You're the youngest person at this event. And so you get up and, and you're at first I thought you were reading off your phone, but you're not like you, you knew exactly what you were going to say. You didn't fumble. I was didn't... filming it. Yeah. I yeah. Was and then Angela was filming uh, to the left of me as well. So I have two angles. So the angle that you see on screen is my angle. And then it, it pans to her angle. So, you know, because obviously I can't film myself, but, um, but I did record it. Wow. And so, so pretty much the crowd starts reacting pretty quickly John after Durham. You His report getting... came out and found that the FBI under your watch, the FBI under your watch acted inappropriately. It's and... interesting because you're not, everything you're saying is true. And it's at this point, I'm like, wow, at this point, it just seems like in 2023, these people feel like, well, we've picked our side. You know, our loyalty is with the Democratic Party. We came to see this guy speak. We've already decided that we like him. They just didn't want to hear it. And you're yeah. very clearly just stating facts and you're not screaming, you're not hitting anybody. And as soon as they hear a, a, a dissenting voice, they're like, get out, get out. And it's like everything you're saying has been proven. Yeah. And look at, they're the ones assaulting me. Like, look at the way they're attacking me, pulling on my jacket. Wow. And then at one point the security guy has, has Comey and I don't know who this other guy is has them leave He's an of the event okay and look at them these people are so old and crusty and it's just like i feel like i'm at a nursing home here like when you pan i'm so glad you panned to this crowd oh there's one somebody brought their like grandson over here but it's it's amazing that you just can't ask a question you there can you know it's uh yeah, in this country, you, you're not apparently you're not allowed to speak the truth. You're not allowed to ask a question anymore. So, so much for freedom of speech. And then you go, you go outside of your car. There's a, you know, there are these two, one, and then eventually two cops there. And you're trying to figure out, like, am I being detained? Do I actually have to stay here and talk to you? And your friend is like amazing and asking her over and over, what crime did she commit? What crime did she commit? And he's like, and she's like, oh, disorderly conduct. It might be trespassing. I'm like, how is it trespassing if it's a public event that you bought a right, ticket for? Exactly. And so, you know, they illegally detain me. You can see I didn't. And then the guy, the, the officer goes, well, you know, we have to detain you to determine if you committed a crime. Well, isn't it supposed to be the other way around? <laughs> I wanted to ask. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you're you're making sense to this guy. He's laughing and he's like. Yeah, his body language, every, everything about how his reaction is like, yeah, you're making some good points. Exactly. <laughs> He's like, oh, why do you have his book? And it, and you're like, it was part of the ticket. Um, so wow, that was just incredible. Do you are you ever? And clearly, this isn't your first time doing this. Do you ever feel nervous, like before, during, after? Are you ever like, how do you feel no. going into it? I usually uh. I usually feel fine. You know, I don't, I don't really get nervous when I'm confronting people. I feel like I have more like anxiety and stress and just everyday normal interactions with everyday people, to be honest with you. I mean, that stresses me out more than, you know, ambushing James Comey or Hillary Clinton or handcuffing myself to Twitter. Like having to send your coffee back and you're like, oh my God, they got the milk wrong. <laughs> no, like having to interact with other people and like social events and not be a homebody. <laughs> really? Do you, do you have a little bit of like social anxiety? Yeah, because I don't really go out a lot. You know, I don't go out. I'm always working. And so I don't really socialize much, I wouldn't say. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, incapable of socializing. Clearly, I, you know, attended a wedding and, <laughs> you know, I can, you know, <laughs> I can meet new people and socialize. I ran for Congress and, you know, I'm capable of speaking with people, but I don't like going out and doing things, right? Like I don't go to bars. I don't drink. I've never really been a drinker. And, um, 
I don't know. Like, I just don't like going out to go out. I like just kind of hanging out and lounging around and then working. And because you're very goal oriented, but like you're still like very much in the age of like going out and getting like rip roaringly drunk, you know, every weekend. It's good. Like you just know what you want. And uh... oh, so I don't drink, though. So that's the interesting thing. So most people my age, because I just turned 30, right? Most people, if they're not married and they, you know, they don't have kids and <laughs> I'm not married, I don't have kids. They're still like, oh, like, let's go here. Let's go to this bar. And I don't know. It's just never been appealing to me. Are you dating anybody right now? No. Do you want to meet somebody? Because we have some people in the chat that might be interesting. <laughs> Are we going to have to do like a like a Chrissy Meyer dating show? Oh, my God. That would be great. I have done I have done dating shows uh, on my compound media show, Wet Spot. But that can get a little... That can get a little untoward for sure. Oh, we have some questions here. Slag lost. Hi, Laura. Big fan since the Lauren Southern car tire fight. Oh, my God. I don't even know about that. Uh, you went hard at DeSantis for being a creep and possible rapist. What is your opinion on your good friend Ethan Ralph being a convicted sex offender now? What? Okay. I don't know, I don't know about that. Okay. I mean, I know Ethan. I know who Ethan Ralph is, but I don't. I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. I don't know. It's, I'm like, wow. I'm like, just saying, I'm like, it's funny. I'm like, I don't know if all these people know each other. Um, yeah, I had Ethan Ralph on. He, then he kind of uh, turned on me. He was a little rude. Really? Why did he get mad? Yeah, he got mad. I think he got mad on purpose because my mom is dead and his mom died I, more recently. I think I just made a joke or something and he... He could, I think he could tell I was joking, but he just decided to be really, really offended. And I think he just wanted a reason to like rage quit the show. So, I mean, I'm, I'm over it now, but I just thought I'm like, I feel like he was going through something wow. and wanted the attention of just quitting. Cause I was like, I feel like you don't understand me. Like, I feel like that was a joke that you misunderstood. Yeah. But, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he was just a little sensitive that day. Yeah. Um, are you still living with Milo? I don't live with yeah, that's a question for Marjorie Taylor Green, actually. Oh. <laughs> Marjorie's still living with Milo because I don't live with Milo. Milo lives with Marjorie Taylor Green. How did this and now you have you have a do you have a beef with Marjorie Taylor Green? I feel I feel like I am not updated on this at all. Yeah, I mean, look, I just don't really like her. I think that she sold America first out. I think she's very disingenuous, right? She kind of, you know, sold herself as this MAGA darling and uh, said that she was going to take on the establishment. And now she's basically McCarthy's lapdog and, um, you know, doing the bidding for the GOP establishment constantly. And look, she said that she was going to have these J6 tapes released, hasn't released them. Then she says, oh, we released them. <laughs> which was a lie because they haven't released them. Wow. Uh, now she's supporting this debt deal with McCarthy. So I, I mean, what's there to like, honestly, what's there to really like about this lady? And then she doesn't like me because I exposed the fact that, you know, through working with Milo, who she, you know, employed to work with her um, in her office and also on her campaign, he's the one that set President Trump up at Mar-a-Lago with the, the yay dinner. And what I mean by setting up is this was supposed to be a private dinner <laughs> between Yay and President Trump. And then Milo leaked all this information to the press. And Marjorie is the one who used her campaign funds to pay for the A24 domain uh, the same exact day as the dinner. And then she lied and said that Milo was only, um, you know, a summer intern. And like what she thinks we're all as brain dead as she is and that we don't know that November isn't a summer month. So, wow, this and it made the you could look it up too. Rolling Stone wrote about this as well. And um, this was a really big scandal recently, a big story that I broke, but not a fan. Wow. And OK, so this is <laughs> you said in our chat earlier, Roger Stone wants you to mud wrestle Marjorie Taylor Greene and Christina um, Pushaw. <laughs> yeah, he does. You know, he, he, <laughs> he said I should mud wrestle uh, Christina Pushaw, who's the rapid response director for Ron DeSantis. And then he said, Whoever um, whoever wins gets to take Marjorie Taylor Greene. So I don't know. I think that I think that we could find a worthy cause. I'm I'm willing to get down in the in the down and dirty in the mud and. You know, I think a lot of people would watch that. Wrestle some women. Yeah, I think most people either enjoy at least one of you, and most people enjoy mud wrestling. So I think that would be 
a success. Yeah. Uh, what's up, K-Max? Chrissy's friend Ann Coulter has become as anti-Trump as Laura Loomer is pro-Trump and anti-DeSantis. How did it end up this way? I wish Ann and Laura could debate this point. I mean, from what I've heard from Anya, yeah, she was she liked him a lot at first. And then it's from what I can remember that she said, like, he just didn't take on the swamp like he said he would. But again, like, I, I wouldn't. Look, quote Anne has her opinions. I've known Anne for years. You know, she inspired me from a young age. And I think that, you know, she's earned her she's earned her stripes, uh, you know, being one of the original female uh, conservative commentators and authors. And so. Um, you know, her, her, I think that her career certainly transcends um, any current drama between Trump or um, DeSantis. I mean, you know, look, I don't, I don't agree with her on, on this at all, because I am very pro Trump. And I, you know, do not like Ron DeSantis. And you know, I've been <laughs> aggressively working against Ron DeSantis. Uh, but Ann Coulter was certainly a household name in conservative <clears throat> Uh, politics long before even President Trump was um, elected to president um, in his first term. So, um, yeah, she's prolific. She's written like nine books or something. I mean, she knows yeah. her shit. Uh, yeah, it, it's been interesting to see since and I and I learned this through watching one of your videos that the reason why DeSantis waited till uh, I guess like late May to announce uh, that he was running was because he had to wait for some kind of uh, like a, a some kind of a deal or policy in Florida that normally, law, if, so. you, if, if you announced right, if you announced that you're running, you have to resign. He the legislature he pushed the legislature to change the Florida resign to run law so that he could uh, run for president and also keep his job as governor because there is a, a law called resign to run that said that if you were going to run for another office, you would have to resign. Like Byron Donalds had to resign from the Florida House when he ran for Congress. Okay, and Ron DeSantis himself resigned from Congress to run for governor when he ran in 2018. So it really just says a lot about a person when they're willing to act in such an authoritarian way, like literally changing the law just to benefit themselves and their own political aspirations. This isn't something that's really going to benefit other people. It's just, you know, a carve out so that Ron DeSantis can basically live like a welfare queen. <laughs> he, wants, he wants the Florida taxpayers to pay for his lodging at the governor's mansion to pay for his security and his transportation and his travel to pay for his childcare for his three children. But what <laughs> we're going to have a part-time governor. We're going to have an absentee governor. I mean, the guy's like a welfare queen at this point. So what was the point of even running for reelection as governor? If you weren't mm. going to actually serve out your full term, what would you say to people who like Ron DeSantis because of how he handled COVID and how he's handled Florida and how he's fought against Disney? And I, I think that it's overblown and overhyped. I mean, look, I live in Florida and the fact of the matter is, is that the Disney situation is a disaster. If anything, you know, Disney has trumped DeSantis. I wouldn't exactly call Ron DeSantis's war with Disney a victory. I mean, th there's been thousands of jobs that have been lost in the state of Florida as a result of his war with Disney. And now he's being sued and he's using taxpayer money to fight this lawsuit, which is really just an ego Damn. trip for the governor so that he could have fodder, right, for this woke agenda for his presidential campaign. Mm. Because everything about Ron DeSantis is about wokeness and the culture war as opposed to like, you know, economic policy and farm policy and immigration. And, you know, I'm not saying that the culture war doesn't matter. But at the same time, like, what are you going to do for the economy? What are you going to do with regards to farm policy? Like these things matter more to everyday Americans than just, you know, what what Disney who like the types of causes that Disney World is donating to. Right. So, I wonder if, yeah, I wonder if his focus on fighting the woke is to kind of match what Trump has been up against. I feel like they're throwing lawsuit after bullshit lawsuit at him to trying to like just bog him down. Um, and I feel like if you if you look at what's happening to Trump, like it's the establishment clearly going after him. Like this to me, it's like oh, they still can't get over the fact that he ran and won and uh, woke up so many people to. Yeah to the to the mainstream media and they're just well, I mean, I think back at him very phony right because all of this stuff like this entire i guess you could say persona that ron DeSantis has created this facade that he's presented to the state of florida and really our entire country over these last few years um has been an effort to try to mimic right 
Donald Trump's personality and his mannerisms all the way down to like his hands, uh, his hand movements, the way that he signs things. There's videos that show mm. it. It's like he's trying to be Donald Trump, except it's not that he wants to be Donald Trump to take his policies. He wants to be Donald Trump to pretend that he's going to replicate his policies and, you know, be the like the torchbearer for the America first agenda and then stab MAGA in the back because his policies are anything but America first. And as somebody who lives in Florida, look, I ran for Congress in 2020 in Florida and we had lockdowns. I couldn't even knock doors for most of my campaign wow. because in Palm Beach County where I was living, you know, they were threatening to arrest people if they violated lockdown orders. So I think that for other people that live in blue states or people like in Jersey or New York or, you know, California, when you look at Florida, it's like, wow, it's such a 180, right? Because of how drastic it was in California. But we still had lockdowns. The governor was still a vaccine mm. salesman. He wants to try to rewrite history now in his effort to, you know, run for president and challenge Donald Trump. But, um, you know, when you actually look at his record and you look at the fact that a lot of his initiatives have been struck down and <laughs> they haven't really gone through, for example, right? They said, oh, we're going to block um, hormone uh, transitioning therapy for children in the state of Florida. Well, <laughs> Everybody's like, woo, you know, go Ron DeSantis. And obviously I'm against gender transitioning hormones for minors, but it's a lie for Ron DeSantis to say that, you know, it's illegal in the state of Florida now. A court just struck it down. So, you know, Ron DeSantis says one thing, but then doesn't actually want to address the follow up or the follow through, right? Like he did this with the big tech legislation where he said, oh, yeah, you know, it's now illegal in the state of Florida. And, for, for candidates to be censored and deplatformed by big tech. But then my campaign, both of them were completely censored and deplatformed by big tech. And he never said a word about it. Just like he's saying now, oh, you know, my digital bill of rights is going to hold these companies accountable. But, you know, where were you when this was actually happening? Right. Like anybody can say they're going to do anything when they're running for office. But when you're when you actually had the opportunity to do it, how come you didn't do it? And you know, it's because Ron DeSantis is like a Democrat in the sense that he enjoys weaponizing the agencies and the federal government, not the federal government, but state government, just like the federal government is weaponized against conservatives. I think that Ron DeSantis has this like very, you know, authoritarian mindset. Um, mm. And he it's like kind of like a dictator complex in a sense. And he's known for being very vindictive and like weaponizing state agencies against his own political opponents. And like he just did this recently with the Florida Republican legislature, pretty much strong arming all of them saying, you're going to endorse me for my presidential run. And if you don't, we're not going to support your legislative efforts. And like, he's not the one directly saying this, right? But he has his chief of staff going around making threats to Republican lawmakers who feel like, oh, well, I'm not going to get the, the, the funds that I need in the budget unless I support Ron DeSantis. And you know, that's what dictators do. That's what authoritarians do in these third world regimes and countries um, that really aren't too, uh, you know, different from, from our country these days. Uh, and I just wish that, you know, people would take time to do the research themselves instead of just listening to what Fox News tells them. Because, you know, Fox is essentially the DeSantis News Network now. You have Rupert Murdoch, wow. who owns Fox and Wall Street Journal and New York Post. And, you know, they just gave him a multi-million dollar book deal and, you know, your average person doesn't know that all of these media entities are owned by the same person who has publicly stated that he wants to work against President Donald Trump and, you know, invited Ron DeSantis to his ranch in California, where he said that they were going to dedicate all their resources and their media platforms um, from the Murdoch empire to help Ron DeSantis get elected as president. Wow. Yeah. And this is a good comment from Larry DeSantis pissed off many Floridians here with his two month world tour pretending he was president. And that I guess it's he referring to his his book tour <laughs> two months. It's like seven months. He's been he's been going on a tour since November when uh, he won reelection. So this has been going on for almost like seven months now. So, you know, look at November. The governor was, you know, out of state giving speeches. And uh, really, he's not he's not here in the state of Florida. And the fact of the matter is, is we're nearing hurricane season here in Florida and we're going to need a governor that's actually going to be here to address any catastrophe or damage that Floridians sustain from hurricane season. And while DeSantis is busy pretending to be some presidential, you know, wannabe Donald Trump candidate, um, the the state insurer of last resort, the, the citizens insurance, uh, property insurance that 
millions of Floridians are now um, are now policyholders of, they have gone insolvent, which means that if yeah. there's a massive uh, environmental catastrophe, like a hurricane or some kind of tropical storm that does a lot of damage, uh, most Floridians who have this policy are not going to be able to have their claims fulfilled. And there's already a crisis in the state of Florida because over the last year, um, over six main Florida um, home insurance providers and auto insurance uh, providers have gone completely insolvent. And you have a lot of Floridians now who don't have insurance and they're scrambling to find insurance. And the insurer of last resort through the state, which is overseen by the governor, has no funds. And what is the governor doing about it? So I, I think there's going to be like a massive foreclosure crisis, a massive wow. crisis. And, you know, I know this is heavy for usually the kind of stuff you probably talk about on your show. No, but this is good. This is really good because I feel like so many people are going, oh, like, oh, DeSantis, it's just if you don't if you don't like Trump's personality. Right. Uh, but you still want to exactly. vote Republican. Go they say, to, oh, he's Trump without the baggage. Actually, no, he's not Trump at all. Like, you know, that's the that's the image and this facade that I'm talking about that the media has been trying to create for him over these last few years. Um, but it's all been do it's all been done intentionally. It's almost like he's some type of Manchurian candidate in the way that they've been like grooming him. And now with the indictment coming for President Trump, you know, it, it it's it's almost like this has all been orchestrated. And you see mm -hmm. reports from over a year ago where. You know, there are reports that came out that show that Ron DeSantis was waiting for Trump to be indicted because then he was going to, you know, come out from the shadows and run for president and stab him in the back. And that's exactly what's happening. All of these people should be standing by President Trump right now. It doesn't matter if you think he's too brash. It doesn't matter if you don't like his personality or, you know, you think he's offensive or a mean or a bully. The fact of the matter is, is if the United States government can get away with weaponizing their entire system, law enforcement and, and the DOJ and our, our whole justice system, rather a system of injustice, okay, in its present current form, then what's to say they're not going to come for you and your family next? If they can get away with doing this to a sitting United States president and, you know, a, a lead, the leading GOP contender for president and, you know, one of the most powerful people in the world, then what's going to stop them? from coming after you. And that's why President Trump always says, um, you know, I'm I'm just standing in between between you and them. Right. Because once he's gone, then it's game over and they can get away with anything. No one's going to push back against what's happening to Trump. Definitely. Um, from Front Porch Conservative, Laura is right about DeSantis. If he were Trump's VP, then it would be like Reagan Bush. We think we're getting third term of Trump. We get non-MAGA. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mostly understood that. <laughs> what would you say to to people who who feel burned by Trump because of how he pushed the the vax and how and sort of like how he sort of handled COVID? Because I've just I've heard a lot of complaints about that. Oh, I could never for until Trump, you know, apologizes for that. I could never support him. It seems like I just feel like there's a lot of people who were on his side who are very hung up about that. And they're hung up about the fact that he didn't drain the swamp when he had the chance. Look, I'm super anti-vax. I never took the COVID vax, even when, you know, I was running for Congress and everybody was saying, oh, you have to issue statements. I remember getting into arguments with my campaign staff over this because I said, I am not going to, you know, talk about the vaccine. Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to push the vaccine. I don't believe in vaccines. I think that all vaccines are somewhat dangerous. I mean, obviously, right, we have vaccines for things like polio and, you know, malaria and other things like that, smallpox. Um, but I think that uh, it's very dangerous, this habit that people have of when they have a baby taking their newborn baby to go get 10, 15, 20 jabs. I think that there's evidence that shows that there's a lot of... Um, correlation between uh, childhood vaccines and autism. And I don't even take the flu shot. Like I'm, right. I'm one of those people where I don't even want to get a flu shot. Okay. Because same, because I don't, do you feel like it was more like he, it was who was surrounding him? Yeah. And, and so I was never for the vaccine and look, I don't like the fact that Donald Trump has pushed the vaccine, but at the same time, he never mandated it. Right. So at the end of the day, nothing was stopping any of these other people from being like me and saying, hey, like, <laughs> I support Donald Trump, but 
There's no way in hell that I'm going to put something in my body that was fast tracked over six months. There's, you know, there's, there's medications out there that go through cl clinical trials for 10, 15 years before they're ever allowed on the market. So why, why would people think that it was okay to put a vaccine in your body after six months of trials? I mean, right. It's, it's it seems like maybe that. some Regardless folks are blaming him for where they themselves could have stood up a little harder or, well, or fought a little harder personal responsibility because look every i think all these politicians push the vaccine i'm not i'm not saying that trump never pushed the vaccine he did uh but he never mandated it and so he gave you a choice whether you wanted to take it if you wanted to be pissed off with anybody be pissed off with you know state state governments or be pissed off with employers that mandated it and told you like you're not going to be able to feed your kids unless you jab yourself with this poison. So I think it's, poison. yeah, that seems like I, more corporatism. Like yeah. just, yeah. But also people need to take responsibility for themselves. Like they say, Oh, Trump told us it was safe. Well, look, you could also have discernment and say, well, is it really safe to be putting something in my body that was only tested for a few months? That's how I thought of it. And I'm one of the most diehard Trump supporters I know. And just because Donald Trump was talking about the vaccine doesn't mean that I would ever inject myself. I, I thought it was a bad idea from the get-go. And yeah, Santos is on video talking about how the vaccine is so great, talking about how he signed for the vaccines personally from FedEx, how he himself took it. I mean, look, DeSantis is going to have a hard time trying to present himself as like some anti-vax candidate and blaming Trump for COVID mm -hmm. when there's plenty of receipts to go around that show that Florida was a lockdown state. Uh, we had a pastor that was arrested in the state of Florida for violating lockdown orders. One of the first pastors to be arrested in over a hundred years in our country. Um, you know, these, are, yeah. these are not exactly good accomplishments for the state of Florida, but it seems like DeSantis and his you know team of paid influencers, they want to, they want to practice revisionist history. So instead of actually coming clean about the facts that Governor DeSantis was a pro-vaccine, uh, pro-vaccine misinformation <laughs> candidate, and he also said that the vaccine is like 99% effective. He's on video saying this. He said that you can't get COVID if you get the vaccine, which is a lie, right? DeSantis right. Yeah, but this is all, everyone knows this stuff that, now. That yeah. So I just find yeah. it, I just find it to be intellectually dishonest. People can be upset with Trump, but why not be equally upset with Ron DeSantis? Right. Or, or their company or their state, uh, you know, it's everyone kind of participated in it it's a, it's a it's a very fucked up situation and i really feel for the people that needed their you know they couldn't afford to lose their job so they had they were just bullied into it uh mark start them too but at the same time like yeah. you know i hate to say it <laughs> but i'm gonna you say still it. had that choice yeah more americans would have actually joined forces there's more of us than them and i'm not advocating for violence but eventually americans kind of have to grow a pair of balls and say <laughs> Okay, am I going to ingest myself a poison or am I going to take to the streets? I'm not advocating for violence, but I am saying that, you know, we have a First Amendment and a Second Amendment for a reason. Yeah. And when somebody is telling you they're putting a gun to your head and they're saying you're not going to be able to feed your kids unless you inject yourself with this poison or else I'm going to fire you. It's time for people to take to the streets. And unfortunately, right. too many Americans, people all around the world, they just laid over and said, eh, whatever, it's just a jab. Yeah. Mark Sart, uh, DeSantis is a deep state plant. He's backed by the Bush family and Paul Ryan. He can't be trusted. Ooh, spicy take. I have no idea if that's true or not. Uh, yes. Ron DeSantis backed away from ending special districts when a Disney lackey approached him. The 200 million in campaign donations will get paid back. Thank you, Matthew Hammond. Um, geez, this is quite the screen name here. Jay's gaping butthole. Laura is a no BS mega lady like Mrs. Lake. You won't get help from DeSantis. Trump said day one digital bill of rights. Trump 24. Noise. True. Like and it. now DeSantis is trying to come out and steal uh, Trump's idea. So, you know, everything that DeSantis does, it's a rip off of what Donald Trump has done. Even his his uh, his campaign slogan. Oh, the great American comeback. <laughs> DeSantis 2024. Well, the great American comeback was the, the name of President Trump's speech about our economy in 2020. So everything that Ron DeSantis does is a rip off from Donald Trump. 
And it's very sinister because he's tried, a lot of people thought, a lot of people fell for it. They said, wow, you know, Ron DeSantis, he could really be president someday after Trump uh, serves his second term. <laughs> yeah. I think that's When I say he's a Manchurian candidate, I think that's how the media intentionally wanted him to be portrayed. Because look, there were other states that handled, uh, that handled COVID way better than Ron DeSantis. There were other states that were open before Florida. There were other states like that- North Was North Dakota like completely unscathed? Yeah. And, and, uh, there were a lot of states that, that, you know, that were open and had less restrictions at first, right. When COVID first happened, Florida had one of the most draconian lockdowns out of the entire country. People want to forget this. Not only did we have lockdowns, but we had checkpoints in order to get into the state. So when you were driving from other states into Florida, you had to be checked. So wow. They want to pretend like Florida is some free state where woke goes to die, where, you know, everybody's free and we have no medical tyranny. But there was once a point in time when you had to enter a checkpoint in order to get into the state of Florida during COVID. That's crazy. Yeah, I remember like because I live in New York, they would they were like shutting down entire. It was insane, like entire towns. It was uh it was really wild. Ghost Crusaders, yay, 2024. Yeah, I haven't heard much from Kanye West since his little media tour. Uh, Matthew Hammond, who should be Trump's VP? I like anti-ESG Vivek. Oh, Ramaswani. God, I don't know. I have no opinion. I like Carrie her. Lake. Honestly, I think Carrie Lake should be his VP. I think she's a badass. Yeah, I mean, we definitely. need someone who's no nonsense who's going to be loyal, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Trump's biggest issue is like the loyalty issue. We need we need people who are going to be loyal because as we saw in his first term, look, Trump's got the policies, Trump's got the charisma, Trump's got the energy, but he's got an HR problem. And I think that mm -hmm. um, I think that the biggest issue is going to be whether or not he gets a better team this time around. And then people will say, oh, this is my favorite line, right? Oh, Trump had such bad hires. How can we trust him in a second term? Well, Ron DeSantis literally just hired everybody who went who worked for Trump in his first term. So if you didn't like all the hires that Trump had in his first term, what makes you think that they're going to be better working with Ron DeSantis? So, I mean, it's just incredible dishonesty coming from the DeSantis camp. And I don't know, for your everyday person that doesn't follow this closely, people who are normal, who, you know, aren't total political junkies like me, um, who actually have social lives and leave their home. <laughs> Yeah, till four in the morning online, like reading, you know, <laughs> all the different political op-eds. Oh, you could have a social life, Laura. But you, you know, what I'm like sometimes I think I have to remind myself, like, hey, you know, you're not you're not really normal in the sense that there's other people out there who are not paying as much attention because they they are not as immersed in this as you are. And so I find myself getting incredibly frustrated with people, mm. but you know, a lot of times people are busy, they're married, they have kids, they're working two jobs, sometimes three jobs, and they're just turning on the radio or the news to get the the debrief of what they hear. And they're just kind of believing and hoping for the best that what they're hearing on TV or on the radio is true. And, um, and it's not a lot of the time. So I can understand why a lot of people get duped into believing false information about candidates or believing that people are you know, it's that somebody, somebody who they're not somebody that they're like falsely presenting themselves as. I, I agree. And I have to remember, like, right. Most people have. I mean, I, I was that person, too, with a nine to five until I got fired December of 21 from my day job. Uh, I worked in a, for a corporate media company. I wouldn't take the jab. So I was like, I guess I'm done. I guess I'm doing full time comedy and podcasting now, which is like was such a blessing and needed to happen. But I understand like, yeah, most people they're working, they have kids, they're married, they have maybe a sick elderly parent and you have like you, the bandwidth for information is so small. Maybe they can donate right. 10 percent to figuring out what's going on yeah. uh, in politics. And that's why with the mainstream media, uh, their role is was so damaging because m there's so many people who just think, oh, Trump, like uh, mean tweets and and all these lawsuits and oh, God, like uh, just. But then you look at like legitimately what's going on with the Biden family and the and the ridiculous corruption and like it just the fact that Hunter is a crackhead and everyone's just seems to be OK with it. It's like not a big deal. <laughs> it's it's uh, that's what Trump really did for me was wake me up to to fake news and uh just hearing him say it over and over again and then one day it just clicked and then the pandemic so i had all this time to look into stuff and i was just like yeah wow. yeah yeah 
I mean, the plan, the pandemic, in a sense, even though it was awful, it was kind of a, a the silver lining or the blessing in disguise was the fact that so many people were locked down. They were able to consume more information and it made more people wake up to what was happening in our country and it caused more people to start paying attention. And, um, you know, I was sitting on an airplane yesterday and next to a lady who said the same thing. She's like, I love Trump. I could never admit it because I live in California. And, you know, I just... I don't know. I was never really political, but after COVID and when Gavin Newsom locked the state down and his kids were going to all their private lessons and their private schools oh. and kids had to stay home, I just started to start paying attention more. And it's true. Like how many people yeah. not Pelosi involved, getting not, her hair cut? Yeah. You know, how many people were not involved? And then they finally woke up because they were just so outraged. It's something that affected everybody, regardless of where you live in the world. Everybody was affected by COVID. So um I have to remind myself of that sometimes because I just yeah it's not that they're willfully stupid or or not curious or don't want to know the truth it's just like their bandwidth they have they just don't have the time like they just right. it's a uh, yeah it's something you have to be that's why I have people on like you who know way more than I do and are way smarter um Jay's gaping butthole again Laura Loomer if I weren't attached to Jay Ooh, oh, these are some people volunteering maybe to date you in the chat. How how um, lovely. K-Max, what did Laura think of the whole Kanye West debacle? Well, I mean, with the campaign, look, everybody has a right to run. Um, my biggest issue with uh, the Yay campaign, it wasn't necessarily Yay himself. It was the fact that, that Milo you know, pretty much just used him as a way to try to make money. And then they, they took, they took somebody who had good intentions, right. Or somebody who had like a genuine political curiosity and they weaponized it against him for the sake of trying to embarrass president Trump. So that was my biggest mm, issue wow. was that this was just supposed to be like a dinner between yay and Trump. And then M Milo decided that he wanted to embarrass Trump and that's what he did. Right. He even admitted it to the media. And then Marjorie Taylor green, who, you know, I don't like her. I made that very clear. She's the one that paid with her campaign funds for the yay domain. And it was registered to Milo's number. He was like living in Rome, Georgia, which is where she lives. And she was lying the entire time about how Milo wasn't working for her. And Milo wasn't her intern when clearly this shows that, you know, why, why else would Milo have his name registered to a domain uh, the same day of the dinner that, that she paid for with her campaign funds that was registered to his name if, if they weren't working together. Right. So, um, I just think that, uh, people took advantage of yay. And I think yeah, that, so um, this is a guy who's obviously like very artistic and somewhat eccentric. Uh, you know, I've had conversations with him before. Um, he likes me, you know, he talked to me when he was live on Infowars. Oh, wow. You know, I have nothing negative to say about him. Uh, I respect his right to free speech, but I do think that there's people that view him as a cash cow and they're just trying to take mm. advantage of him. That's that's personally what I think. I think there's a lot of people that are trying to mislead him in an effort to take his money and run. Yeah, I agree with that. I think he's a cr like a creative genius. I don't know that he his talents are best served running for president. And yeah, sometimes with creative and people, that's, like that's what I told him. I said, yeah. look, I love your music. And, you know, I don't obviously agree with everything you say. Like as a Jewish woman, I really can't get down with all the Hitler stuff. You know, you can respect that. I'm sure. Right. And <laughs> we had a pleasant conversation and it was fine. And it, my, my issue was that I think that, you know, when you have creative personalities and people who have a lot of money, like he does. And I even said this to him. I said, I don't want anything from you. <laughs> uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene falsely accused me of trying to work for the yay campaign. I never wanted to work for yay. Cause I've always been a Trump supporter. Yay actually asked me to work for him. He actually wow. said, Hey, would you come work on my campaign? And I said, no, I said no, because I support president Donald Trump, but I personally think that you need to separate yourself from these people who you currently have. I was referring to Milo, of course, um, because I think Milo is trying to just use you for your money. And then eventually Milo was fired. But the reality is, is, you know, he's, he's clearly been taken advantage of a lot of people have clearly made a lot of money off of him. And I don't think it's right 
Uh, just because somebody has a lot of money and they have an idea doesn't necessarily mean you should entertain that idea. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should take their yeah. money if you and think they're indicted. And they also put them in legal jeopardy because, oh, wow. you know, saying that you're running for president without without filing paperwork could actually you know, get you in trouble. Like, clearly, Ron DeSantis is above the law and he's been running his shadow campaign and the deep state's not going to be holding him accountable. But <laughs> nothing is stopping somebody from, you know, filing an FEC complaint against Ye. Um, because like when you when you're operating uh, a presidential campaign without filing the appropriate paperwork and you're paying people, that's a, that's a campaign. You have to be documenting this and you have to have official paperwork with the FEC. So the, the people who uh, tried to exploit him and make money off of him not only used him, but they also uh, put him in legal jeopardy, which I think oh, is wow. very simple to do. And, and I think the more rich and famous you are, the more likely you are to have a lot of yes people around you. And you need I think you need someone to yeah. be real with you. And, and tell you hard truths. So and that's what I told him when he asked me, he said, do you want to work for me? I said, no, I said, I support president Trump, but it's, if you want my advice, I would advise you to, um, you know, have better people around you because whoever's advising you isn't really giving you great counsel right now because, uh, you're in violation of the law. Technically oh, wow. speaking, like if somebody really wanted to make an issue of it, they could have found him in violation of the FEC laws. That's and so you know, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not hostile towards him. I yeah. was just telling him, look, I don't want your money. I don't want anything from you, but I, I can't work for you. I like your music. I respect your right to free speech, but look, you got to get better people. And I don't know. Were you ever, were you ever friends with Milo? I just met him once. At, we he, were used once. Do, he used to do yeah. shows at compound, at the compound media studios. And I, I was there and I was like, Oh, hi Milo. And it's interesting because my first impression is like his energy, like, fills a room like he has such a presence and i was like oh this is i'm like i have a show here it's called wet spot he's like oh it's dreadful like he totally roasted me for the name of my show he's like it's disgusting he's like <laughs> and then he told me what i was wearing was frumpy and i was upset for like a good month after that but you know he was probably right but that was that was my only experience with it. and wow. twice i tried to get him on my podcast and he bailed both times and one time one of those times he wanted me to buy a bottle of Sancerre wine for the podcast. And then he didn't show up. So I had to just like angrily yeah, drink it by myself. Not, he's a, he's a, he's a prima donna. Okay. He's unreliable. Okay. I mean, look, why does somebody have to give you top shelf alcohol or, you know, it was like $20. Drink? Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't drink. So I don't even know like what's top shelf and what's not, but you know, I just know people who have invited him out to speak before. And it's like, Oh, I need to have this like, thousand dollar bottle of champagne and i need to have this wow. and this needs to be this and this i, I don't wish know. i had the confidence to ask for like seltzer even someone's going to invite you out to speak or they want you on your show like why don't you just make it easy for them why do you have to be such a like a like a prissy prima donna and so high maintenance you know and well yeah we used to be friends years ago before he decided to just be totally vindictive and nasty and and turn into like a serial pathological liar but I don't, I don't tolerate that. I can't be around people like that. You know, people who want to use me and be my friend when it's convenient to do so. And then people who go and make up vicious lies about me one, you know, the next minute wow. just to get ahead if it means making more money. So I'm a very loyal person and I, I don't, I don't want drama in my life, believe it or not. I know that may sound like, you know, oh, really, Laura, you don't want drama. In oh, your life. no, I, like, I, really I respect what you do. Life, you know? I think I it's really cool that you can go up in front of people and uh, and call them out on their shit because there's just not enough people doing that. Um, what was your like, did you always want to get into politics? And what would you say was your first kind of uh, I don't want to say a viral moment, but something that that put you on the map as I, I guess a sort of like, yeah, public uh, I, guess I, was always, I was always political in the sense that, you know, I was interested in politics. I went to a boarding school. And so I didn't really, I went to a boarding school in the middle of nowhere on a ranch in Arizona. So it was a very secluded kind of uh, sheltered uh, upbringing in that sense. And um, when I, when I finished high school, I actually graduated high school on my 18th birthday. And I said, Oh, I can't wait to go to college. I'm going to move as far away from my family as possible on the other side of the country. And wait, gonna, where are you from again? Arizona. Oh, you're from Arizona. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So I moved to Massachusetts at first and did a semester at Mount Holyoke college. And I thought, Oh, wow, this is gonna be great. You know, it's a prestigious university it used to be considered Harvard for women when, uh, when Harvard was all men and 
you know, I thought, oh, I'm just going to go to this elite, you know, New England, uh, New England college and whatever, right? I just had this idea in my mind that, that my success was going to be tied to the name of the university that I attended. And then I quickly realized that was a bunch of bullshit and that, you know, I had been brainwashed by college counselors who told me, oh, you have to go to the best school possible in terms of like the most prestigious school if you want to get anywhere in your life. And I said, why am I paying all this money to basically be indoctrinated by these radical leftist professors and hmm. be, be around these um, I mean, it was pretty much all lesbians. It was crazy. It was a women's wow. couple. And, and there were some straight women there too, but they have this thing called lugs and bugs. I, I wrote it in my book. They called it lesbians until graduation or bisexuals until graduation. And, lugs and bugs. this is like very oh weird God. for me because obviously I'm straight. I mean, not a lesbian, but I also don't really care. Like if someone wants to live their life, how they want to live it. Okay, fine. But it just became too in your face to the point where it was actually distorting the intellectual discussions taking place in the classroom, right? Like I could see the beginnings of all this, uh, the trans agenda being pushed oh, down wow. my throat in my university system. <laughs> and then I what said- What year was that? So you started- This to, you were... in uh, 2011, 2012. Yeah. Okay. Was it 2011? So 2011 and I just, I just transferred. I transferred to a school called Barry university in Miami. I, I just didn't want to be at Mount Holyoke anymore. And um, I ended up becoming the president of the college Republicans and uh, getting into the honors program and getting a pretty good scholarship um, that covered a lot of my education uh, in Miami and it was fine. And I made the best of it. And I realized it's what you make of your experience, not necessarily where you go. Yeah. What class or professor did you start? I don't know if you can remember, like, where you're like, oh, wow, this feels like uh, indoctrination. This feels like an agenda is being pushed. So I had this anthropology professor at Mount Holyoke, and I was actually studying cultural anthropology. And, you know, <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to take some anthropology classes because I said, oh, it's my freshman year. And. Um, you know, I'm interested in politics, I'm interested in media, but you had to take elective courses as well. So I thought, let me just take some of these elective courses and, you know, get it out of the way. And um, I remember taking this cultural anthropology class and the, the professor showed us this uh, documentary about these women who lived in, um, I think it was like, um, like Serbia, right? And if I'm recalling correctly, <laughs> and it was this documentary about women who were very butch, right? Like these would be like butch lesbians. If you Volleyball were to, players. Like, yes. Just call them <laughs> butch lesbos. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these were women who they said assume the role of men after their male family members were killed in the war. And I'm like, okay, so obviously like, you know, they're acting like lesbians. They look like lesbians. They're butch. The professor goes, oh, they're not lesbians. These are not just women, right? These are not just lesbian women. I'm like, what are you talking about? And the entire, the entire, uh, like two week seminar on this, on this documentary that we had to watch in class and talk about and write papers about was about the concept of a third sex. And wow. I was like, no, there's only, there's only two sexes. And they were said, no, it's a third sex. And I, I remember saying in class, no, just because you look like a butch lesbian doesn't mean that there's a third sex. And I right. just remember that my classmates were like screaming at the professor to kick me out of class because I was <gasps> in class with all these lesbians who had armpit hair and they thought what I said was the most offensive thing ever. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like I refuse to entertain the idea that there wow. are no sexes. Like these are butch women, either tomboys or asexual uh, you know, kind of masculine women, if they're not lesbians, and if they are, then they're lesbians, like they're, they're butch lesbians. Why, why is this so hard for people to understand? Um, and that's when I realized, wow, this is really crazy. And I'm going to have to go along with this if I wow. want to do well in this class. And I don't know, I just, I just thought to myself, why am I going to pay all this money? It was like $65,000 a year to go to that school. And I'm thinking, why would I want to like, rack up all this college debt just so that I can be indoctrinated with this bullshit. Wow. I wasn't even thinking about debt when I was in college. And like, I was, I graduated in like, uh, whew, like, Oh, 
five. So it was before a lot of it really started ramping up. But I was like a women's studies minor. Like I chose like I was interested in learning about all the different because I was very much a feminist. And that was I was in that brainwashed phase of life. And uh, I, I think after I graduated, like I think the 2010s were very pivotal for the agenda pushing in, in academia. So but that's amazing. That sounds like the first moment where you really, you know, I'm, I'm like picturing you kind of were you kind of standing up in front of the class or you were just speaking your mind to the professor? You were just like, oh, this sounds like bullshit. I just raised my hand and I said, yeah. this is bullshit. And I mean, the professor wasn't entertained because he was like very into it. And, you know, he was very wow. passionate about trying to, you know, convince all these 20 something year old college girls that there was a third sex. And, you know, there's, there's only so much arguing you can do. Like if somebody is that brainwashed or that convinced on selling their propaganda, right? Like you could say two plus two equals four, but you know, if somebody is so convinced in their propaganda and their brainwashing, right. Two plus two is wow. five. So, so you graduate, then do you immediately start? How do you so find actually, Project Veritas? So I, actually, so I actually started working with Project Veritas when I was, um, like a senior in college. Right. So okay. I met James O'Keefe when I was a junior and then, um, he ended up uh, hiring me my senior year um, and I was working for Fox news at the time a Fox affiliate in Miami. Uh, I would go to school full time. I would take 21 credits. And then I was also working 40 hours a week as well. So yeah. I would take classes from seven in the morning until like three o'clock in the afternoon. And then I would immediately, I would immediately go, Oh, someone tried calling me. I would immediately go to, um, to the news station where then I would work an eight hour shift and I would get home. Holy cow. Night. Yeah. Wow. And so uh, James O'Keefe actually like paid me to quit my job and come work with him. And I was doing investigations while I was still um, at my university. So I ended up uh, doing an investigation into Black Lives Matter that made the front page of the New York Post when I was in college and nobody knew wow. that it was me. And then I, I ended up getting kicked out of college a month before graduation because I did an expose on my university exposing their wokeness. Um, ah, oh, my God. <laughs> they wouldn't give you your credits or anything? Well, I was supposed to be valedictorian and I was actually expelled a month before graduation. The honors program finished early, right? So I had already finished by that time and I was just waiting to defend my thesis. And so at that time... Um, when they kicked me out, like they said, oh, you're not allowed to go to your graduation. And then we threatened to sue the university and James paid for a lawyer. And ultimately wow. they had already received so much embarrassment because the story went viral and was all over the news. And because ultimately what I did was I started an ISIS club. Okay. Because they were discriminating against me for being a college Republican. So I said, I bet you they wouldn't have no problem with an ISIS club. They just don't like Republicans. And lo and behold, I was right. So I started an ISIS club and I got, I wore a hidden camera and I went to the professors and they said that I could start my ISIS club and that um, I should change the name so people don't actually know that I'm sending money to ISIS, right? And the story was wow. so, um, so big and we actually replicated it at Cornell as well, uh, the same script and uh, Cornell fell for it as well. And yeah, they kicked me out. They expelled me. That's amazing, but hilarious, but so embarrassing for them. Yeah. So I didn't get to go to my graduation. They sent me my diploma in the mail. Oh, no. We should really stage like a, a graduation ceremony for you, Laura. Yeah. You deserve it. <laughs> you know, it's fine. Like, look, college graduation, I think, is really overrated. I think my dad was actually more excited for it than I was. He was pretty pissed off. I remember, oh, I just can't believe you. You know, I booked these tickets months ago and now I have to, you know, sit here and not go to graduation. And I said, well, you go to a graduation, you have to sit there for like five hours in a room and pretend like you care about all these other people who are getting their diplomas yeah, and then no you cross the stage for 15 seconds and you turn and get a photo. Like it's kind of a waste of time. The only two things I remember about my college graduation is I, I, I thought I was so hilarious because I was like, I had a lay, like, you know, like a Hawaiian lay, uh, and the, I guess the guy that was handing out the di diplomas, I mean, it was a Jesuit school or Catholic or whatever. So he was some sort of not called the headman. I forget what his title was, but I was like, I was so happy with myself that I like put a lay on him and he had so many hands to shake that he wasn't able to take it off until like 30 people later. And I was like, ha, I thought it was so funny. And the other thing I remember is like, my mom told my brother to go get the family <laughs> coffee or whatever. And, um, 
they were like, go get a box of Joe. And then he just got cups of coffee from Dunkin' Donuts. And they all just ended up spilling in this plastic bag. So they were like, by the time he got back, it was just a bag of coffee with like lids floating it. And then my mom thought it was so funny. She called it bag of Joe. That's literally the only thing I remember. And and that was like a, again, like a 36 grand a year school. So, I mean, it's like a big party for, for people who, who don't go to college and just go get it's. I can see the allure even now in 2023 for like kids graduating college. It is kind of like, it feels like a party you don't have to pay for, for four years because you're just not in a frame of mind to think about debt or, or really paying many of your own bills yet. Even if you do have your own job, you're not used to paying rent yet. So unless you really want to get a specific degree to like be a doctor or a lawyer or something, it's like, eh. Yeah. Exactly. I I didn't need a BA to do this. Um, okay. What I want to know, did we talk about, when did you first start to feel like you were getting a lot of censorship your way? Cause you said you were at one point you were banned on Twitter, but then you came back. What with them? Um, was you my you, Twitter account back in December. I was banned for almost like four and a half years, almost five years. Right. So wow. it's crazy, but I really first started to get, um, censored a lot in 2017, 2018. So, um, I was banned on Uber, Lyft, and Uber, Uber. In, in 2017. And then I officially got banned on Twitter in 2018. And then I found myself banned everywhere else after that, like banks, uh, Instagram, Facebook, GoFundMe, PayPal, Venmo. I had Chase Bank and they had shut my online it's- bank down at <laughs> the time. And then it was this big scandal. And then they tried to act like it never happened. And they contacted a few, you know people like myself it's always chase yeah. every time somebody right. gets their bank so, shut down it's always chase so they had they had at one point in time shut down my online access to my banking so um i got banned from patreon um venmo paypal gofundme cash app damn T-Spring. did you then did you then join let's see Right, was true social a thing yet? Then there was Patreon. I was, on Gab. I was on Gab and Getter and Telegram, and I also had Parlor. I had one of the largest Parlor accounts until you know they got deplatformed, but Damn. now they're gone. So that sucks. But did you get your Twitter account back? Was that because of Elon Musk or just Elon I- Musk? Yeah, because of the the amnesty. He said that he was going to give the accounts that had been banned amnesty. So I did get my account back, and but it didn't really. I mean, look, I'm grateful that I got my account back. I'm not going to say it didn't do anything because it's great to have my account back. But I also ran for Congress twice in 2020 and 2022, and I had no access to social media when I was running for Congress. So, you know, it would have been nice, right? It would have been nice yeah. to actually have an account when I was running because I'd be in Congress right now if it weren't for all the censorship. Yeah. And do you think you'll run again? I want to run again. Yeah, I do want to run again, but I also really don't have faith in our elections in the state of Florida. I don't have faith in our elections in this country. Um, I do want to run again, though. I just it's not about whether I want to run or if I would run. It's just I have now been cheated out of an election twice and people will say, oh, you're so crazy. You know, you're not getting cheated. You're just a loser. Just admit it. When, when you are out raising your opponent and you're outperforming your opponent, who's an incumbent both times around and you have no access to social media and the censorship and the vitriol against you is so great that Uh, not even the media will allow you to have a debate while they allow for every other candidate to debate. I mean, that, that censorship when Comcast, okay. Who's the internet service provider blocks your campaign from sending texts and emails. That is censorship, especially when they're donating to your opponent. Um, This is an unprecedented level of censorship and, Unfortunately, nobody in the GOP really did anything to help me when this happened. And so uh, Ron DeSantis yeah. certainly didn't do anything to raise awareness about this big tech election interference in the state of Florida. And just a matter of whether we're going to actually have election integrity, because I believe in my capabilities. But at the same time, we're not we're not really living in a fair system. Yeah, it's it's really upsetting. Um, what do you think is like the most... What do you think most people misunderstand about you? What do you think is the biggest, I guess, misconception? People will call me crazy and they'll say things like, oh, you know, she's. 
you know, people said for a long time that I'm anti-Muslim, which I'm not. They they called me a white supremacist, and I don't know. They so they say I'm crazy. They call me that too. It's it's like I'm not anti-Muslim. I'm not a white supremacist. I'm anti-Sharia. I don't really want to see women get their clits chopped off. You know, if that makes me anti-Muslim, so be it. I don't want to see gays get pushed off of buildings, and you know, even even I don't even want to see trans get hung from cranes, believe it or not. I really don't. I don't believe that's right. I don't think that's that's humane. I don't like that. And I spoke out about this and I, I exposed Ilhan Omar for marrying her brother and being a total Jew hater. And for that, they called me anti-Muslim. And I made a few spicy takes about, you know, Muslim Uber drivers after um, a Muslim Uber driver uh, used his car to and he was an Uber driver. He really was to mow down 12 people in a bike lane in New York city and kill eight of them and yeah. then pledge allegiance to ISIS. And yeah, I made some spicy takes for the sake of provocation to raise awareness about Twitter's uh, or to raise awareness about Uber's um, lack of safety uh, and their lack of vetting for a lot of these uh, drivers. And so um, I think that, you know, it was an easy scapegoat for people. I was one of the canaries in the coal mine and I was just a punching bag for the left and the right that they both ganged up on. And they really enjoyed, uh, you know, using me as their shared, um, collective punching bag. Uh, and that's why nothing was ever done about it. But I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not unhinged. I'm not crazy in the sense that like, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> you know, some people think that I'm crazy because, I'm very out there in the sense that I have courage to stand up and call people out like, wow, that was crazy. I can't believe you did that. But I'm not, it's not like I'm mentally ill, right? And no, God, no. You just have balls. You have more balls than Dylan Mulvaney. As though I'm some mental case. And it's really weird to me because obviously I'm a very, you know, intellectual person and, you know, I'm pretty capable of taking care of myself and doing a lot of pretty profound things. If I was not well in some capacity, I wouldn't really be able to do a lot of this stuff. Um, yeah, I think it's just an easy insult. It's an easy put down to just call somebody crazy. I think that's very lazy. Yeah. Well, it's a way to discredit them too, right? Like, oh, don't, don't listen to what she has to say because she's a conspiracy theorist or she's crazy or like what Marjorie said when I was exposing her, oh, she's mentally ill, right? Like, looks like everything yeah. she said about you turned out to be true, so... It's lazy. Chrissy triggers lives with chicken jokes and Laura triggers lives for being Laura. Oh, yeah. It's a great, great. team. Um, okay. Amazing. I'm going to pull up your book. I'm going to pull up your website here. Um, everybody check out Laura's book. Loomered how I became the most banned woman in the world. Yeah, that's my book and it's available online or they can go to my website, loomered.com and that's where they can buy uh, regular copies for $30 or I also sign copies for $50. Oh, I'm having a coughing fit. Amazing. Check out the book. Follow Laura on Twitter at Laura Loomer. Check out her website, loomered.com. Any final thoughts, Laura? Yeah, I also have a sub stack. So if people are, you know, interested in learning more about the things that I discussed tonight, or they want to, you know, follow my investigations, they can go to lauralumer.substack.com. It's free. Uh, you can upgrade a subscription for seven a month if you want to, you know, support my journalism and my activism. But uh, I, I, you know, spend a lot of my time doing investigative reports and activism, and um, I want more people to absorb this information that I'm putting out. And now that I'm back on Twitter, you can follow me at Laura Loomer on Twitter. I'm on, I'm on Gab, Getter, and Truth Social at Laura Loomer. And I'm on uh, Telegram as well. Amazing. And stay tuned if we, we will let you know if there is a mud wrestling match. <laughs> Tell them more. Yeah, um, yeah, that would be fun. Laura, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming on. You're an absolute <laughs> delight. Yeah, I appreciate it. So fun to talk to. Come back anytime. Thank you I to will. the chat. I will come back. And one of these days, I'm going to have to go hang out with you and Lila. Yes. Yes. We will do a hang. We will do a hang soon. Uh, thank you guys for listening. We will see you next time.